So when we're dealing with any search method, we do have a few pieces of terminology that we do have to be mindful of. The first one is obviously this sort of term known as completeness. Again, if we're thinking about some of the more common ones that you've seen in data structures, uh, does it actually get to a solution if one does in fact exist? That's sort of an important one if you think about it. But again, if we think about sort of my example with the airports, I could take the RDU to Charlotte to Chicago to Seattle route. That's going to get me uh, one potential solution, or I might have found the longer one first. I, I don't remember which airports were even in it. Uh, and so that actually leads into sort of this question of it. When we find a solution, is it the optimal solution? Because that is sort of important when we're dealing with choosing the best actions. And then when you sort of kind of think about it, we get back into the, the data structures 316 land, where once again, we're having to deal with the idea of space and time complexity. When it's doing these searches, how much memory needs to be taken place? And then specifically, if it is going to get me the optimal solution, right? Does it have to traverse every possible pathway uh, to figure that out? So these types of things sort of become a little important. Some other more terminology, at least more when we start to turn this into some math for a second, we do introduce a few different uh, letters into mathematical cool equation. B refers to this idea of the branching factor. And if we're thinking about sort of an agent, uh, especially our, our first little foray at the Rook or your, your self-cleaning robot, right? I have an agent that is sitting in the middle. Well, what is all the possible moves that that agent can do? And for our sake, I'm making it a little simple. There's only four moves that they can do. They could move up, down, left, or right. And so when we start to think about those possible moves, and at least sort of uh, in this perfect world, we would say that it has a branching factor of a four. And then we start to look at, well, when we're dealing with our goal. And what we're dealing with here is specifically this D. If I'm looking for a goal, let's say again, this is my starting point, and this is a potential goal point. Well, again, if we happen to have, you know, just go left, all right, well, that's gonna get me there and we again say that that would be an optimal solution so the optimal solution would have a depth of one it only took one step to get to the goal but then we also have the maximum depth of the search spaces let's arbitrarily say that each one of these uh again up down lefts and rights that we could do from this potential state uh so i went down well, you know, again, we'll arbitrarily say that, yeah, going down again gets to our goal, whatever it was. Get out of the box, right? Uh, oh, again, okay, we can see that uh, going down gets us to there, left, right. You know, all of them will get me to the goal. But specifically, the big part here is this idea that what's the maximum depth as we're going through our search? Because, again, when we start to think about things like time and uh, optimality, again, that maximum depth may come back to haunt us. And so that's where I'll at least introduce to start a very simple uh, one that you've seen from your data structures course. So data structures, a little bit of a review, is this idea of a breadth first search. What we're dealing here, uh, dealing with here is this idea that when I work through a search, so if I'm at my starting point and I want to sort of explore all possible sort of pathways, I'm going to look at all of my possible steps before digging any deeper. So in my case of just uh, an agent that can move up, down, left, and right, again, I would branch out and see my four possible next steps. And then I would follow that same process over again. I'd see, oh, you know, if I take this first route, what can it see? Well, it can see four possible routes as well. Okay, what about my next child? Well, it has four possible routes as well. What about my next child? Four possible routes 
again. And again, we can see this a little cleaner if we sort of walk through it. And here's a little bit of a refresher on the algorithm. You can pause the video here uh, if you'd like to just copy it over. But the big idea is that we're going to be focusing on this idea of a queue or something being first in, first out. Again, as soon as I see my children, those are the next ones that I'm going to be considering. So let's use this as a, a, a little bit of a refresher, this idea that I have a starting point. I'm calling it A. And I want to traverse through my nodes. Maybe I want to find I or I want to find uh, some goal that does not exist. So some uh, goal that does not exist. Notice there's no connection here. All right, well, once again, notice I'm operating with the queue. And notice I have a starting point going on here. When I sort of start my search, I start by adding in my starting point into the queue. Because if we walk through the algorithm, notice again, what happens is I'm asking specifically, is the queue empty? Oh, well, it's not because we just added that A. Okay, well, what do we do? We are going to remove it from the queue and do, you know, again, from data structures, we always just sort of use the air quotes of visit. But from our sake, what we're going to do is we're going to grab all of the children of sort of A, and guess what? They're going to get added into our queue. So again, I've added in my A not, and that's mostly just to sign signify a starting node. So again, A telling me what the node is, not simply just saying, oh, this is my starting point. It started from nothing. Okay, well, again, we are going to remove A from the queue. It's been visited. And then notice A has, in our case, five children going, again, this is just sort of from a purely theoretical graph. Uh, suddenly, I could go to node B, node C, node D, node E, and node H. So in order that they were presented, they are then added into the queue. All right, well, since I've added them all in, I reach back to the top of the algorithm, and I'm going to dequeue B. And that's exactly what I do. I've, de I've removed B from the queue, and, well, B happened to have its own child node that it could work off of, and so, again, it's added to the queue. Again, since the queue is first in, first out, it's going to the very bottom of that queue. All right, well, we walk through the algorithm again. We see that C is now at the top of the queue, so it's going to be the next thing removed. And since it's the next thing removed, we look at its children, see it has a child, we add G here. And notice, again, one of the things you're seeing here is sort of this idea that I'm keeping track of where I came from as well. And that's sort of an important point as we start to try and figure things out. Uh, again, from we've achieved our goal, how do I get to that goal? And so again, we keep on walking through this. If C had a, another node attached to it, let's say it was Z, Z would have came in and we would have just moved on just like normal. Either way, we see that D from A is sort of the next thing in the queue. You know the song and dance. It gets removed. D happens to have its own child, I, and so I is once again added to the queue. And we continue to walk through this. So again, we see E. E doesn't have any children. You could think of it like it, it is a dead end uh, in a corridor. And so, okay, well, we're, we're done. So no, no other places to search. H, sort of the same way. I go up, oh, there's nothing there. I go down, oh, there's nothing there. All right, well, keep on searching with whatever's in the queue. We see F, G, and I, they all do the same thing. And again, if we're thinking about it, if I was the goal, congratulations, I found my goal, I have a solution. And since I knew where it came from, again, if we thought about these little points here, we see that I came from D, well, where did D come from? D came from A. I know that A was my starting point. And so my first step would be, oh, go to D. But what happens if I don't have a goal? 
right? What happens if no goal was found? All right, well, what Brett First is going to be able to tell us, what Brett First is able to say is if we've traversed everything, again, we've traversed all possible pathways and we were not able to reach a goal condition, then in sort of the sad fashion, that goal is impossible to reach. And so when we're looking at the idea of the breadth first search, again, we can go back to our sort of terminology. Is it a complete search? Well, yeah, uh, if a, a solution is going to be solved or if a solution is able to be found, awesome, it will find it. Uh, optimal, yes, actually, it will because, again, if we're thinking about sort of the breadth first search, it's only looking one step ahead the entire time. So eventually, if I happen to find a goal, let me just draw this out here and I'll, I'll say the goals right here. If the goal is able to be found, again, since I'm only making minimal numbers of steps, hey, I happen to have found a super cheap goal. Nice. And so what's the time and space complexity? Well, uh, again, if we're thinking about that B, that's telling me my branching factor. And then D, again, was the optimal step. Uh, so in our case, uh, it, was, it took two steps, two in our case, plus one. Again, this is sort of... Uh, we may have better solutions, so we may have to go through the entire thing uh, of all of the breadth first searches, and that's a little bit on the uh, hairier side of things. More to the point, though, is again, it, it shows a possible one step at a time search. Okay, well, what would be sort of the exact opposite of this? And again, we're still in data structures land, and it's known as the depth first search. Rather than, say, going only one step at a time, we're going to pull and dig and go down that rabbit hole until we reach what you could call a, that's not how you write a D, a dead end. The entire idea is, again, you can see from the pseudocode, what happens is I'm at sort of my starting location. And I'm going to say, all right, all right well, let me go ahead and say, all right, I've gone through, I, I hit my uh, depth first search helper. I look at S, all right, fine. I've, I've looked into S and I mark it, you know, again, this is the visit, uh, visit. description that we saw in the last algorithm but specifically notice it's saying oh, all right well what happens next and let's say again we're still working off of that branching factor of four let's go up well again what happens is i'm looking for sort of what's the node sort of at the end of this tunnel and then notice i'm calling the depth first search all over again if up has more possible routes if i can go up again do that first. I have not checked out down. I'm going to keep on pulling on this thread until I reach sort of a dead end or the goal. And when that happens, what we do is if we reach a dead end, we introduce another term called backtrack. This is sort of where recursion comes uh, back all of a sudden. I'm going to go from sort of my dead end back to my parent. And if my parent had more edges, more pathways that it could take like that down, it's going to try and do it. If this also happened to be a, a dead end, once again, it's going to backtrack and then try its next route as well. So a way to think about this is now we're dealing, instead of a queue, we're dealing with a stack. Again, the idea here is something going to be first in, but last out. So you see all of a sudden, again, I've drawn out the same little diagram and everything, but I haven't visited A quite yet, right? I'm, I have not done that portion, visit being I'm just sort of deciding where to go. So again, I'm gonna remove A from my stack, 
and I see that I happen to have, again, the same uh, possible pathways that I work off of. But again, I'm dealing with a stack. So the next element that gets removed is going to be B, same as before, but again, being a stack first and last out, when I get to B, I'm gonna see that B has its own child and F is gonna to go to the top of the stack. And notice again, I have sort of this little red dot following sort of where I am, where I am. Because again, when we deal with that idea of dead ends and backtracking, I'm gonna sort of need to know that. So again, I go down to F because F is the next thing in my stack. So I go down to it, but I notice that F does not have any other pathways. So no other moves from here. And this is not my goal. Well, what do I do? So I'm going to do backtracking. This idea that from F, well, where did F come from? F came from B. So let me go back to B. Backtracking. Well, B also has no other paths other paths so i'm going to backtrack again i'm going to go from b and say well where did b come from oh it came from a let's go back to a and as you can sort of see well a has more children so it's going to go to c c has a child it's going to go to g we backtrack again because G was at another dead end. C has no other possible pathways. So I go back to A, I go to D, and we repeat the process over and over again. I won't spare, I'll spare you sort of going through it uh, again, but sort of when we look at sort of those properties now, we ask some questions. Is the depth first search a complete search? And that's where we get into a little bit of an issue because technically speaking, a depth first search could lead to infinite loops. A way to think about that is, again, let's draw out sort of our three by three grid. Mm -hmm. And let's arbitrarily say I happen to have another f column. And let me add a little bit of a, uh, we'll call it a wall right here. Well, you notice that, again, if I go up, it's going to take me one direction. If I go down, it's going to take me the other. But more specifically, again, when we think about this idea of something potentially having infinite loops, you notice that I could, in theory, follow this chain that's going to lead me to sort of this point. All right, not terrible. I, you know, I could have got there uh, easier. But if I keep following suit, if I don't have a mechanism to sort of stop those infinite loops, I could just go in a circle the entire time around this grid because, again, I can. And so that actually leads to the idea of it. Is it possible to, or is it an optimal solution? Also, no, actually, because, again, if we're thinking about this, what if this was our goal point and we started from this node and we walked all the way? Sure, we would have found a goal, but as you can imagine, it's not gonna be as good as going up and then to the left. Again, this depends on which action you're taking first. And so when we think about its space and time complexity, we run into that sort of ugly M. Again, think about that as the maximum depth. Because again, I could potentially uh, exhaust all possible moves that I'd need to do to get here. So again, if I went down and I'm taking the worst possible solutions, that M would take me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight moves, uh, M equaling eight, rather than the optimal solution. So the optimal solution was D2. We're not taking that two. We're having to go all the way around. So Again, it's a trade-off uh, of what we're dealing with here, but hopefully that was an introduction to uninformed and depth first. In the next video, we'll actually see a little bit of sort of a marriage between the breadth first and the depth first known as iterative deepening search.